Hello everybody, this is Chuck Wigger, State Senator for the area, and today I'm going to visit with Lee Eggerstrom from Maplewood, and Lee contacted me earlier this year about a recommendation he had to recognize World War II veterans, and specifically that we honor the last World War II vet to die with a special ceremony. Uh, Lee, welcome to the state capitol, and please share with me what you communicated, and then I will give an update on what has happened so far. Well, yes, all right, thanks. This is, a, this is actually a fun thing that started with a 10-year-old girl in, in Texas whose grandfather was a Medal of Honor winner, and when he died, she didn't understand why there wasn't a state funeral for him. So out of this- Was that a, a World War II two, veteran? But, yes, exactly, and, and a Medal of Honor winner. Well, anyway, and that, Medal of Honor, just for our viewers, what, that is a uh, oh, high honor. That is indeed, and uh, and of course, with World War II, you know, there uh, <laughs> that was the gen the greatest generation, as yes. Tom Brokaw has pointed out, and the sacrifices were for real. It was an enormous national effort, and uh, but there are only three, uh, or four, excuse me, four Medal of Honor recipients from World War II left living. Yes. And they range in age from 93 to 97. Yes. So uh, this ad hoc group associated with the, the uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans started to say, well, let's have the last remaining Medal of Honor become a state funeral and then use that as a salute to all 16 million men and women who served in World War II. Yes. And so that's the movement. There's efforts like what you're doing here in Minnesota now in 23 states. And, uh, and if we're lucky, 10 years from now, that last, you know, the, the last Medal of Honor, you know, may live for another 10 years or so, but the, it could also be 10 days given the age. So, yes. so subsequently, we're, we're getting, trying to get efforts to, for states to petition the White House to make plans for a state funeral. It's rarely done for, uh, non, you know, f former heads of state, for, for right. former presidents. It's rarely done. It's been done for a few World War II leaders. No. It's never been done for an enlisted man who's mm -hmm. in, you know, the non-officer class. Well, these last four Medal of Honor re recipients were all enlisted men. So yes. this would be unique, a, a tremendous salute in that regard, too. Well, I so much appreciate that effort and with the idea that you mentioned from uh, uh, a young lady in Texas, and then it caught fire. And and uh, also, I want to share. Uh, my dad served in World War II, and uh, made it back. But uh, he had a Purple Heart almost died uh, on the operating table, but it was able to uh, obviously return and uh, be with us for many years. Uh, but he did pass away in the, the late 1970s. Yes. So uh, one of those 16 million that served. And so when we uh, talked, uh, we I mentioned there's resolutions, bills that go in. And uh, we did put in a bill, it's Senate file 1022. And also uh, this there's a coalition of people working on this, uh, another bill uh, very similar to it, Senate file 686, authored by Senator Mark Johnson, went in, but there's bipartisan support for this legislation. And this is what a bill looks like, uh, where we put together language. And you know, if you'd like, uh, you know, there's a few you know, whereas clauses, and if you'd like to just uh, mention this so sure. our, our viewers can get an idea of what it looks like then in a conversation, and then when we put an idea into a bill. We'll just give an example of some of the statements. Absolutely, but one of it, the whereas over 16 million Americans served in World War II, and that is men and women, both. Yes. And uh, whereas uh, on half of a million are still alive today, and uh, there are hundreds of World War II veterans dying every day, so the numbers are de 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 depleting real quickly. How many one person has died uh, during our conversation? I mean, it's, 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 that's the yeah, reality that's of the age The group. law of numbers. Yes. Absolutely. But it, also I'll point out, there were 326,000 Minnesota men and women who yes. served during that war. Yep. And we did have, I, th I think it was about five or six Medal of Honor uh, recipients who are all now deceased from Minnesota. Yes. So, I mean, it's just, uh, uh, the sec but the other thing is this gives a chance to stress, and I know your background with education. Yes. It's just that 
we don't know what a, a raucous world environment that our children and school-age children are involved today. Yes. And I think we, this group that's been involved in this thinks it's terribly important that the next generation knows what the previous yeah. generations did to sacrifice. Yes. For, and in Minnesota, it's so unique too because the food and ag sector is so huge here. Yes. And so there was just enormous work being done for, to prepare foods, to process food, to feed our allies, to feed our servicemen and women. Yes. And, um, and to, you, you win wars and you lose the peace with food. Yes. And I'm going to pursue that a little bit further in terms of some of your professional work that you've done uh, just as a journalist, uh, to share that for those that may not uh, be aware of that. Uh, but uh, continuing in the resolution then, we've touched on points, uh -huh. but then it, ultimately uh -huh. this would go to the president. Yes. Yep. And, the pre and the president is the only one who has uh, the authority to uh, declare uh, a, a state funeral. Yes. And, uh, and it becomes routine. There is actually a committee that's uh, involved. In the, the National Commander of the American Legion serves on yes. that committee. So, and uh, so th it's a, there's a process. But like everything else in government, there has to be a process. And, yes. and there is with this. And, and there's a lot of distractions that people in high places can be s subjected to. Right. And, and so subsequently, by states staking passing resolutions such as what you're considering here in Minnesota. It's, yes. just, uh, it's just a reminder that uh, we haven't forgotten. We don't want you to forget. We want you to be prepared. Never forget. And uh, so we have the, the resolution. I mentioned it's making progress in Senator Bruce Anderson's committee passed and referred to the rules. I assume it's going to get to the floor. So uh, thanks for communicating that uh, with us. And uh, we are very uh, optimistic it's going to make it to the oh. finish line and hopefully uh, when that day does come there will be the uh, appropriate uh, recognition for that last uh, uh, remaining person uh, to be with us in the world so yes so we're very appreciative of what you and your colleagues are doing yes, here bipartisan support yeah, absolutely. And, now, and lee uh, you have spent your career as a journalist, a reporter, uh, an author, uh, and a, a sampling. I believe you have written over 17, 18 books. Well, okay. Maybe just share it with the viewers, uh, you know, some of the highlights of uh, that background. Well, it, it's just bizarre, but again, remembering hard times, World War II, 1980s was an extremely hard time with the Minnesota economy, yes. in particular rural Minnesota. And uh, so subsequently, I was this food and agriculture writer for uh, the St. Paul Pioneer Press yes. and for the Knight Ritter newspaper chain. Yes. And, uh, and so I ended up writing a lot of things. I ended up winning a sabbatical. I went to Europe and studied what they were doing to cope with uh, the changing global economy. And then I came back and I started writing about the need for value added processing yes. and how to create local markets. And then that led to how you do that through membership organization, community development, and cooperative businesses. Yes. So anyway, one thing leads to another. <laughs> and the minute you have one book out, then people start saying, now you should do it, and you get involved. So anyway, it's, it's 16 books later. Technically, there's a 17th, but it, I think that's one was translated from a previously published book in, uh, from the University of Illinois system. That, and it's been another country. Yeah, in Brazil. So yeah, well, I mean, that it, it's a Portuguese, too. you know. So okay. I've never seen it, you know. But but <laughs> I, but 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 uh, Brazilian economists have read it and use it as a textbook. So I know it's out there. But but so it's just been one thing after another, and including a, a number of international yeah. people and uh, such such as that book right there. And maybe we could j just show if you'd like to show the covers on some of these and you know, right. uh, you know a, a, a highlight or two. Uh. All right, well this, this was actually the first one, Make No Small Plans, a cooperative revival for little America. This is when the Minnesota economy was really in the tank. Yes. And uh, the, there was a rural to uh, urban migration that underway, the small towns were dying and it was a really sad times. And the only way to turn that around when you couldn't trade was in fact to in fact do something with what you could grow locally, sir. Mm -hmm. And so we did. Anyway, this created a new a business model called the New Generation Cooperatives. Yes. And it's a play off of, uh, it's almost an inside joke for business professors because uh, of something called horizon problems that involve all institutions and organizations for 
the third generation doesn't remember why the first generation started a company or did something. Yeah. And uh, it's a play off that. So uh, that's what, uh, make no small, it's, it's the calling now on third and fourth generation people in the countryside to in fact make their own businesses again. Yeah. Just like their grandparents did, kind yeah. of. So, so that's had an impact. Let's then, take a, then, a couple and, more here. And then here, this this became a, a this is actually first done in this is in Dutch, but the European international. Union, m m <laughs> <laughs> give me the translation. Uh, international market mark van cooperatives, which is the it's it's essentially the international market power of cooperatives. Okay. And uh, then this uh, after this Dutch version was published with uh, two Dutch economists that it did, then we had a, a variation of it published in English, and that's, that's what this is. Okay. But uh, it just, uh, uh, because the minute this thing hit, that was, the European Union had conferences on that, because they realized it's not just for what you may do in Minnesota, or what you may do in Belgium or Denmark, but it's for everybody's international development efforts around the world in Asia and in so South America globally we're and, and interdependent. Africa. So, yeah. So subsequently that became important. Well, then that led to other things. Then the University of Illinois, I've been in three or four books. I've got chapters or case studies. In this case, it's new generation cooperative case studies. I've got a couple of case studies in there, including mm -hmm. out or over from Stillwater, the Northern Vineyards Cooperative. Okay. And, and, um, that became an important model, incidentally, since this is your neighborhood. Okay, I got to tell you this. That became an important model because of uh, uh, when the European, uh, when the Eastern European, the, the Soviet Empire collapsed, yeah. and all of a sudden Hungary and, and these countries are now free again. They're becoming a, a capitalist society, but does that mean you wanted the the American and European distillers to come in and buy up all your local little wineries? Yeah. No, I mean, the only way to save those things in, was to restructure them as cooperatives. Yeah. And so they're using the Stillwater, Minnesota model of, from Northern Vineyards over here to, yeah. to do that. That's exciting. Yes. Well, uh, a great legacy. And uh, you know, just briefly, uh, where were you raised and what brought you to eventually to Maplewood? Well, all right. <laughs> Journalism brought me to Maplewood, but I, I was born out of Kirkhoven and uh, at, at west of Wilmer, 10 miles west of Wilmer. Okay. And uh, uh, I went to St. Cloud State, and, uh, and then started worked for the, after the Army. I worked, worked for the St. Cloud Times. Were you a journalist in the Army? Well, that's the irony. Is <laughs> they, I, was a, I started working for my hometown newspaper when I was 14. Ooh, okay. So subsequently, when I got into the, uh, uh, an engineer battalion company out at Wilmer in the yeah. National Guard, they knew that I was pretty proficient with a typewriter. So guess mm -hmm. who was instantly made company clerk? Okay. All right. So anyway, but it didn't take the it didn't take the Minnesota Army National Guard long to figure out, oh, that guy that's a company clerk out there is also the guy that's writing for the St. Cloud Times. Yeah. So I got tapped. So the last four or five years that I was in the, the guards, uh, I was right across the Capitol grounds here at the Adjutant General's office with the okay. Public Information Office. So. Okay, so serving our country, you <laughs> further perfected your skills and eventually you landed at uh, Knight Ritter? Well, yeah, and then, and then for after working in the St. Cloud Times and the St. Paul Pioneer Press and the afternoon paper at the time of the dispatch yeah. hired me to come down from St. And I did that and then I worked here for a couple of years and then was sent to the Washington Bureau. And so I spent the, most of the 70s in the Washington Bureau. and. And then again, the same kind of economic development. Because I r was from a rural area and knew about trade, so I essentially became more of an economics writer than a journal, uh, than, yes. a, than a political writer. And uh, and then 73, October 73, Middle East War. Yes. After that, we had the Arab oil embargo. Yes. And of course, then the usual economic lesson, which is not something that often a lot of people like to discuss in newsrooms. But yeah. hey, now isn't isn't oil a lot like a commodity? Uh, yes, sir, uh, it is a commodity. Yeah. So, uh, so off I go off to the Middle East and cover the end of the, uh, the October War and then spend uh, and into 74, around there is the when the oil spigots come yeah. back on. And, and what are the issues of trade and development that, that are still trying to be resolved today? Yes, 
What, what a life full of significant experiences and uh, sharing them you know, in your books and in your various uh, messages, your advocacy, it's, it's appreciated. Uh, also, I want to point out that uh, Nancy Livingston, who works uh, with us at the State Capitol, uh, she was a colleague of yours. Absolutely, uh, yes. you'd like to share about Nancy? Well, <laughs> she, she was very capable of doing any darn thing that you could throw at her. That's, that's what we remember about Nancy down in the newsroom, I can tell you that. And uh, so she was uh, a, a, a bright light and, uh, but so and still strong, is. And still is, <laughs> but always so strong on education. And mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, she, she was a force you wanted in the newsroom for journalism, but she was a force you wanted in the community for the goods that she could do and make people aware of. Very good. Well, thanks for sharing that. And also uh, on family. Uh, have family that uh, has grown in Maplewood? Yes, three daughters. So uh, one's in Massachusetts, one's in Washington State. But one here, I should mention, is uh, Carrie Eggerstrom Collins, and she's the Ramsey County Community and Economic Development Director. Okay. Well, very good. And if there's any uh, more information that people might want to get just about the, your work, uh, the books, uh, et cetera, is there a way to contact you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Iggerstrom, LL, at msn.com. That's the best way to go. I'm in LinkedIn and all these different things, but then I have to get a, a grandson over to show me. Now, how do I get on that again? So, I mean, just... The, the email, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, very good. Lee Eggerstrom, thank you so much for being an advocate. Uh, resolution remembering our World War II vets, for uh, being an author, a reporter, and for serving our country as well. Thank oh, you very good. much. Thank you. Viewers, thank you for joining us. Get a hold of Lee if you'd like to learn more information about what we've talked about or give me a call. I'd be happy to discuss that as well. My number at the Capitol is 651-296-6820 or my cell, 651-770-0283. And remember, freedom isn't free.